iPhone, so I guess this is a more easy angle, it gives a sort of wider view of things. Um, so yeah, so this video is going to be on the most famous of all the Plecos, Plex, Locarde, and this has to be the common Plecos. And I'm going to specify that I mean Tiroplichthys, and this is a genus um, of Locarde, of Plex. And I'm not going to talk about hypostomus. Hypostomus is not really seen in the trade. Hypostomus plecostomus specifically has not really been seen in the trade at all. So when you're talking about complex, you'll be referring to teroplicthes or teroplicthes. It's uh, the word is quite long. If you break it down, it is only easy the Greek or Latin, and it helps to pronounce it anyway. So regardless of common names. Some members of this genus are actually difficult to find in the trade. They're almost some are not seen at all. And I sort of I might vaguely touch on them, but I'm not really going to talk about them because they're not really entirely relevant. Many cover common names cover sort of a pick and mix of different species in this genus. So common plec might cover them all, excluding more Tyroplicthes scrophus. And generally, you get names like sailfin, um, which can be na a lot of them get called sailfins, um, at least like five or six. And then you've got um, gold spot, you've got a uh, few have L numbers, but I'm not going to really focus on the L numbers because I think when it comes to this genus, it's best to sort of look at what's described already um, because it is can be a bit of a challenging one. So the so Tyroplichthys is in the family Lolcardae, which is what Plexa, and it's in the order Siluriformes, um, Siluriformae. Maybe that sounds better. Um, so that is catfishes. They have dermal plating, not bone, and that is probably the easiest way to sort of identify catfishes, I guess, from some other ones. There is dermal plating; it's not scales. So Tyroplichthys comes from South America and it has invasive populations in North America, Asia and possibly Europe and Africa. So it's a bit difficult some of the records but definitely invasive populations in Southeast Asia and in the North America. So Tyroplichthys contains now syn the synonymized genera Liposarcus and Glyphotichthys. These genera haven't been used in a long time, I've never needed. I think it's decades even. Tyroplichthys is often commonly confused with hypostomus, and this can be easily distinguished. Uh, if I get my example, so I actually have a mummified or dried uh, Tyroplichthys. This is, I believe, a Tyroplichthys. I think it might be Josemanus. It's a very small one. It's a bit, yeah, I think that's possibly Josemanus. And so what I'm referring to is Tyroplichthys will have eight plus soft dorsal rays. So that includes the dorsal spine. Uh, I mean excludes the dorsal spine and is these rays here whereas hypostomus will only have seven soft dorsal rays and generally if you look at the dorsal fin you can see it is very different they can a hypostomus is a massive genus with loads of different species so it's not the easiest to identify um, to species level but you can identify hypostomus generally by body shape in general the patterning is very different there is hypostomus um, Tyroplichthys, which have very similar patterning to hypostomus. This is more your um, Tyroplichthys um, punctatus and Tyroplichthys weberi. They're a little bit more similar to your typical um, hypostomus, but then there is hypostomus, less common hypostomus, they're more similar in patterning to other Tyroplichthys. This genus grows anywhere from 25 cm standard length in Tyroplichthys weberi and Tyroplichthys scrophus um, all the way to 45 cm standard length in Tyroplichthys disjunctivus and Tyroplichthys gibiceps. 
So there is a massive variety of size, not all get as big. And there's a lot of misconceptions with their size. Uh, generally, some are the same size or smaller than um, Scopidensistrus um, or uh, Pseudocanthacus, which are really popular and don't get the hate that Tyriopolicthes does as a genus, which is a real shame because Tyriopolicthes has some really stunning members. They can be deeper bodied or they can be shallower bodied. So this is to, if it, I think it would be Josimanus. Josimanus, like Tyrpithes uh, paradalis and Tyrpithes uh, disjunctivus, they're all pretty common ones. They're quite elongated body. They have a quite elongated body. Whereas Tyrpithes gibiceps can be really deep bodied in body shape. There's 16 currently recognised species in this genus, so there is a bit of debate here and of course L numbers are not currently described species, they are more or less a common name. Um, so the 16 species, so is Tyrapithes ambiceti and that includes the synonymised Tyrapithes anisiti. There's a Crystallicus, oh, I think that's Greek. Um, I've never seen it, I don't think it's one you ever see in the trade. Disjunctivus, that's really common. Um, Etanculatus, that one I've never seen, I don't think is particularly common. Jubiceps, really common. Josiomanus, really common. Literatus, they are, you, you can see them on lists, but they are pretty rare. Um, you're more likely to find, well, even I would say hypostomus um, lutus more easily than uh, Tyrapolicthes literatus and this species has really beautiful, very sort of unusual passing, very similar to Joseph Manus and they're, I would say they're pretty, I'm not, not the easiest to tell apart. Tyrapolicthes um, multiradiatus Reasonably common, I think they're not the easiest to identify, they're pretty similar to the others. You've got Tyrapolicthes paradalis, probably one of the most common, and one of the small ones only gets the 30 centimetre standard length. And this is one that people get, and yes, they outgrow your tank, but they're not massive. You've got Tyrapolicthes panabe. Panabe is one that's really similar to Jose Manus, and it makes it it's pretty difficult to tell apart. Um, and it's pretty uncommon but there is ways um, and I will put some taxonomic keys in the description just to make it easier because I won't include all species. Tyrapolicthes punctatus, Tyrapolicthes scrophus, Tyrapolicthes undecimilis. Um, the first two of those they're pretty easy to find. Punctatus is always confused with Weberi. Um, they're very similar in patterning, it's just a different number of spotting on the abdomen. Obviously, Tyrapolicthes weberi, Tyrapolicthes zinguensis, uh, sorry, Tyrapolicthes zinguensis, I've spelt that wrong, zinguensis being from the Rio Zingu in Brazil, and finally, Tyrapolicthes zuliensis. And so I will talk more in focus now about sort of the ones that we have pretty um, often like so looking at the first one so the first one's that this is a series of photos and I'm hopefully going to be able to edit this properly so you can see here is um, uh, two flick these jibby steps you can see that it's got that giraffe patterning there it's quite a deep bodied fish and you see the giraffe patterning also in the juvenile stage or the juvenile juveniles. Um, most easily confused with Tyrapolicthes here, Jose Manus. Jose Manus has that sort of, um, how would you describe, spotted appearance, reticulated spots, liney spots, they're quite large, it's not as deep of a fish. Quite often both of these will be stunted and they'll be a lot more deeper than they would be naturally. So then I, we have two Plicthes ambusetti slash anisetti. You can see this really vivid white coloration. Um, they're not the easiest to tell apart. Um, 
but this poster does give a sort of an idea and then next to it is to um down across so i'm jumping all around this poster this is tier inflicties disjunctivus and tier inflicties paradalis so i'll be doing a better focus on and this has just got this sort of very plain appearance that I'll be showing different videos of the different species just to make it easier. You've got two Plithys uh, literatus, this is a really good example. I don't have any reliable ones, I've got like ones I've seen. Two Plithys panabe, you can see it's very similar to the gold spot, which is two Plithys josomanus, but maybe its abdomen patterning tends to be a lot more lined I guess rather than the sort of hooked on Tiriplicti dosimanus. Tiriplicti weberi. Weberi I believe has less spotting on the abdomen than Tiriplicti punctatus which is here and Tiriplicti mold irradiatus. So I'm just going to do a quick focus on four of them. So this is Tiriplicti disjunctivus, Tiriplicti disjunctivus and Tiriplicti paradalis. You can see here, I actually have the chocolate phase of Tiriplicti's disjunctivus. You can't, it's more common to get in paradise and that has no patterning. Disjunctivus does get bigger, about 15 centimetres bigger. It has that reticulated pattern and it does vary a lot. There is different variants. And this is Tiriplicti's paradise and that's more spotted, less coagulating um, lines, reticulations. Next is Weberi and Punctatus and you can very clearly see the spotting in either. Punctatus is a lot more spotted. I think Weberi is a lot more common and it's quite difficult to tell in the juveniles. Okay, so... Um, okay, so these species are extremely adaptable. They can survive in a wide range of freshwater habitats and by survive I don't always mean thrive so it's really important to make that distinction so they are invasive species they can survive but it doesn't mean they're really thriving to their sort of full extent in that environment these fish have the potential to live decades longer than any pet horse and in stressful environments such as brackish or harder water, it's less likely they'll probably reach their full life expectancy. These fishes are adapted for softer, more acidic water, and this should be really matched. So I would say don't keep them with African cichlids. Firstly, getting food to the bottom, they will compete a bit too heavily. Well, flow rate isn't a massive issue. These fish are able to faculatively breathe atmospheric air and flow rate would massively help anyway just to process waste at the bottom so don't worry so much but it's still a good idea to maintain those oxygen levels high because generally you want to make sure the fish is less stressed and less likely having to sort of push itself and it just helps move waste around and they do produce a lot um, Generally it's just a diet that might be, if it's high in detritus, anything that's a bit more difficult to digest. Temperature, well, a minimum of 24 degrees centigrade. For Zinguensis, and I might be like saying push for 28 minimum. So it really depends where they're coming from. I'd be tempted to actually give seasonal change to a lot of them and they seem to really benefit from this. Decor, as long as you have plenty of caves is what really matters. Sandy substrate would be good. It could possibly actually benefit their digestion. A lot of species are found with substrate in their digestive tract, so it could be of use. Uh, this and the parameters makes the species actually quite interesting to keep with a variety of potential species from South America, Congo, Southeast Asian species as well. Obviously, like most hypostomine, they are territorial with congeners. Um, and this should be bared in mind um, for any habitat or whatever species you're potentially keeping them with because they can fight and they can kill each other and this does only increase with age I find. Their oxygen requirement does make them adaptable. And it does mean that a lot of Southeast Asian species become available to you and their temperature requirements are quite vast. 
dietary, this species is generalist and omnivore to tritivore. It wants to feed on a wide variety of foods. I'd be tempted actually to feed on Apache Soylent Green with mixed with bottom scratcher that would provide a wide range of nutrition and ingredients that this fish is feeding on. A variety of greens would be nice for enrichment and perhaps trialling something like earthworms or snails. So when it comes to frozen food, I'd really avoid mussels, krill or anything like that. This, they, if uncooked and even if cooked to an extent, will contain diaminase. Diaminase is a growth inhibiting hormone and it does eventually lead to sort of neurological disorders and eventually death. So best to keep those down, they aren't needed. There's plenty of other things you can feed and the nutritional um, require, um, the nutrition is going to be rather minimum. These fish do really deserve more credit. Their size shouldn't be the focus. Given Scoban and Sistra, Pseudocanthicus are valued hypostomous, um, get to the same size or bigger, but much highly valued. This, species, this genus has rare species, and rare shouldn't be of value, I think, but it just shows that it's not all about what some people say you should own. And keep what you will enjoy. Don't just keep them because you think they're adaptable. Keep them because you'll enjoy them because they're going to be with you for life almost. Many species you're pretty unlikely to find in the store. And generally I think the ones that you'll really easily find, Tyrophytes jibiceps is an absolutely stunning fish. It's way more beautiful than some of the ones that a lot of people will buy. Even more colourful than a lot of them. There's an albino variant and Obviously there's the chocolate variants of both uh, Teoplithes um, uh, disjunctivus and Teoplithes paradalis. So it's worth looking at them but they do need bigger tanks. I would go for a minimum of about 500 litres um, for any of the species. Uh, for paradalis and stuff they're a lot less active so you, you could get away with a bit more. But um, the um, jibbyceps is really active, um, so I'll go more. I'll be more inclined to say about a thousand liters. But anyway, thank you for watching. Uh, I could do longer videos on the entire gen genre, but this is the genre that I've done a lot of work on. I kind of, I've seen a lot of the species, um, sort of, and I help a lot of people out with. So anyway, thank you for watching.